Welcome to, um, oh, it's a little hot, um, the uh, uh, Lunch and Learn uh, program for March. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a real exciting uh, uh, program uh, with a very exciting speaker. My name is Carl Teichman. I'm Director of Government and Community Relations with Illinois Wesleyan, and it's the university along with uh, the museum that puts on these programs. Uh, today we have someone who I really don't think needs a whole lot of introduction. It's Greg Coos, who uh, is uh, was the uh, executive director of the uh, History Museum for over 38 years. Um, so I won't bore you with all the details of Greg's uh, career uh, and such. Uh, we're just going to get into uh, having Greg uh, present his program today on uh, the Irish and his unique uh, take on the Irish in McLean County. Greg. Okay, thank you, Carl, I appreciate it. The, um, wh what I'm gonna present here is uh, the first part of a study, hi, <laughs> first part of a study that uh, I've been in, uh, chosen to engage myself in. It's a spin-off of Freedom, Land, and Community, the book that the museum published, and, I know that everybody in here has a copy of the book. And if you do not, there is a sales desk downstairs where you can address that particular issue. Now, the, um, when I did that book, I realized that there were, I was frustrated because I knew I was dealing with what are far larger stories that I could handle in the kind of survey work that I was doing. And because of, how do I want to say, my name is Koos, it's a German name, my mother's name was Rogers, her name was O'Neill, the O'Neills took everybody over. And so my mother raised me as an Irish person, you know, it's just something that happens to you when you're a kid. And so I became very deeply involved in this whole notion of what Irish meant and about the story of Irish people. And so I thought the first piece of my work to come to develop the larger stories that are contained within freedom, land, and opportunity, or freedom, land, and community, uh, I deal with the Irish. And so the paper I'm going to give, this is a paper that I, uh, which started my project, uh, that I gave at the Paris Conference on the Great Irish in Greater Chicago. And the Paris Conference, um, I didn't get to go to Paris because of COVID, you know. Dang, and uh, so I think I gave this at 3 a.m. over Zoom, you know, Paris time, of course. Um, and this is the first of what is now three papers and will soon be four. Uh, Whiskey versus Lager Beer, Bejabers, the Irish, the Bet Noir, the Lincoln's Republican Party is the first. And then the second paper, uh, which will be published this fall by New Hibernia, it, which is a really great journal out of the University of St. Thomas, is titled A Cargo of Irish Girls, Domestic Servants, The Assisted Immigration of Domestic Servants into the Midwest. And I have just finished the first draft of Greening of the Prairie, uh, Irish Farming in Central Illinois. And uh, my fourth paper, which may finish the Irish stories, of which I will soon start writing, is going to deal with a topic that is really, none of these, by the way, these pieces have been covered by in Irish American historiography, uh, looking at how important New Orleans was as a port of entry to Irish immigration into the Mississippi Valley, particularly the upper Mississippi, particularly north of the Ohio River, because there was no point in the period of 1850 and 1860 for Irish to particularly want to land in the South, because the kind of work that they were going to do was being done by slaves, and they were not going to outcompete the labor cost of slavery. And so they really came up north of the Ohio River through New Orleans. And so that'll be my, that one's my next project. Okay, so let's go to whiskey versus lager beer, the Irish, the Bete Noir of Lincoln's Republican Party. In 1859, a notice appeared in the Bloomington Panograph. Mr. Editor, please announce me as a candidate for mayor. Whiskey versus lager beer, the Jabers, signed John O'Brien. 
This wry comment, published in a Republican newspaper, was a jab at the Republican Party, who had been forced to accept German beer drinkers into their new political movement, but continued to reject the Irish as citizens and voters. This minor episode points to the fight for immigrant votes. Would these immigrants cleave to the dominant Illinois Re Democratic Party, or would they join in with the new Republican Party? And that contest for voters, which was the battle between the forces of free labor and slave labor, majorities would determine the future of the country. Slavery or freedom depended upon who could turn out the vote. From 1854 to 1860, a political revolution turned the country's attention to the threat of the expansion of slavery. Those intent on forcing this expansion had a larger goal of establishing slavery nationwide. The political revolution was founded upon the rise of the Illinois Republican Party. Many of that party's key events occurred in McLean County as those local leaders gained influence statewide. In order to gain the voting blocks necessary to stop the spread of slavery, the Republicans brought in disparate elements of other political movements and made the many causes a common cause. Local leaders carried the banner of the failed Whig Party into the Republican movement and worked hard to get the old Whigs to accept this new party. The anti-immigrant know-nothings were offered a bargain. Accept the free thinkers, that is, atheistic materialists and Protestant Germans into the movement, and the Republicans would maintain an anti-Irish Catholic agitation and policy. So that's the deal that's going to be made. With this fusion, the common cause that slavery could expand no more could be won. The know-nothings. There was a good-sized group of know-nothings in McLean County, Illinois. Five lodges were known. The know-nothings were organized as the American Party, but it functioned as a secret society. If asked, members were instructed to respond, I know nothing about the society. Organized in the East in the 1840s, it arose out of fear of immigration. Hundreds of thousands of Irish immigrants, as well as Germans, were arriving at Eastern ports and having a huge impact on labor markets. Both groups enjoyed alcoholic beverages, lager beer for the Germans and whiskey for the Irish. The greatest number of these individuals were Irish Catholic, who in the minds of the Americans appeared to threaten Protestant domination of religious life and expression. By late 1853, lodges were being organized in Bloomington. The Illinois Central Railroad and the Chicago and Mississippi Railroad, that's today's Amtrak line, had brought hundreds of Irish and Germans into McLean County. The lodges provided a base from which organized opposition to immigrants and the Roman Catholic Church could be mounted. The know-nothings were strengthened by their deep alliance with temperance and a prohibition order named the Temple of Honor. So you have a temperance issue as part of this anti-immigration. This element saw its first victories in the city of Bloomington election in April of 1853. Mayoral and council candidates were of two views, the license ticket and the anti-license ticket. It's kind of simplified, isn't it? Licensing made liquor sales legal. The latter won, the anti-license people, and having promised to shut down taverns, they passed an ordinance to do so. The law was so widely ignored, it was challenged in court, and key elements of the ordinance failed legal testing. The election of 1854 put a new mayor in charge. He ignored the liquor trade and ordinances regulating it to the satisfaction of the local saloon keepers, their customers, and suppliers. Attacks on Irish saloons. With increased immigration, coupled with scofflaw Irish saloon keepers and a weakening Whig party, the Bloomington Know Nothing movement grew. Temperance leader and Know Nothing, Franklin Price, was elected mayor in 1855. He was also serving as the American Party coordinator for the 3rd Congressional District. Price was determined to enforce the law and went about it in a very hands-on manner. Accompanied by armed police officers and club-carrying auxiliaries, he set about closing the liquor trade. A whiskey rectifying operation, that is, mixing distilled corn mash and other chemicals into spirits sold under the name of whiskey, gin, or brandy, depending on what chemicals you added, 
and where and they so this rectifying warehouse was closed by Mayor Price and Marshall Briscoe. The barrels within were smashed and emptied. Reynolds and Fuller, the owners of the rectifying operation, sued. And Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, represented the city in the suit. And in that suit, Reynolds and Fuller claimed damages of $2,000, over 250 barrels of spirits, including whiskey, gin, and my favorite, cherry bounce. You know, how can you go through a day without cherry bounce, you know? They were destroyed. They won the suit, opened a new business outside of the city limits, and went back into operation. No nothing members visited the new warehouse one night, crawled under the floorboards, and drilled holes through the barrels, through the floorboards to empty them. So that was a way to go after it, you know? This is kind of like a community in conflict, isn't it, you know? Briscoe and Marshall Steele were delegated to close down John O'Brien's saloon near the Chicago and Mississippi Railroad Depot. This action resulted in broken skulls. Bartender Wood resisted the intrusion of the deputies and her numerous auxiliaries. A newspaper reporter happened across the scene and reported, as we arrived at the depot, a large body of citizens under the direction of the marshal were engaged in breaking up an Irish groggery. The proprietor withdrew a large knife in resisting the marshal, but the latter presenting his revolver, he took to his heels and succeeded in making an escape. The bartender, in assisting his employer in his resistance, had a skull cracked, and his recovery is doubtful. Wood survived. He's the guy with a cracked skull, and he and Wood sued. O'Brien received damages for his loss of liquor stock. Wood received nothing for his skull. Price was not well liked by the Irish saloon keepers and their patrons. On Front Street in downtown Bloomington, so this is Mayor Price, okay, he's not well liked. On Front Street in downtown Bloomington, three saloons operated by John and Patrick O'Brien and Thomas Maloney were slated for a raid. Now, this man has no relation to Brandy, okay, so her family's not implicated. Word was out that Price was going after them, and at 11 p.m., while lead, leading a half-legal mob, the mayor was attacked and knocked down in front of the saloons. So that's hands-on dealing with the mayor, isn't it? His supporters determined to close down the saloons. They went after the three groggeries with crowbars, rocks, clubs, and pistols. They smashed their way into the places amidst an exchange of gunfire. Gaining entry, they destroyed the liquor barrels and busted up the furnishings. Darkness of the night and a certain reluctance by the participants on both sides failed to identify the participants of the Malie. For the Irish Catholics, attacks on their saloons were attacks on their identity, community, and family. Whiskey was part of their lives. Births, weddings, and funerals were all observed and celebrated with a glass, a toast, and the close conviviality of family. Business dealings were sealed with a drink. Saloons were the primary male social center where friendships were made, news shared, political activities organized, jobs hired, and contracts agreed upon. They were a place of social cohesion. Musicians would gather, poems recited, and toasts made. The Irish would defend them. Anti-Catholic character of the Know Nothings under which underlay these events was defended by the Bloomington Pantograph in support of the Know Nothing Party. In an apologia for such an opposition, the Pantograph published a New York paper's explanation. This is what the explanation was. In no way was the movement against the free expression of religion. What the movement opposed was the forced adherence of voters to instruction by Irish bishops. Those ecclesiastical officers were considered the emissaries of a foreign potentate, the Pope. The threat of Roman Catholicism was seen as a foreign power gaining control, political control, through rioting mobs who had threatened citizens. It is held that the great goal of these bishops was to substitute Roman Catholic canon law for local, state, and federal law. Now, much of this stuff should resonate with you all. The attraction of this view in McLean County was based on the fact that so many Roman Catholic Irish were coming into the community. Evangelicals and Whigs were quite serious about temperance. 
Both heavenly and worldly treasure would be withheld from the intemperate, for liquor leads to a decaying and filthy community. There was widespread fear about the Irish. The attacks on the groggeries were a strike for purity and a strike against impiety and Romanism. And Irish hard resistance to such attacks was proof of the unlawfulness of these Catholics. With such attacks, the Irish, who were becoming voters, joined the Democratic Party. In central Illinois, this party was a swing section, was, this party was in the swing section of the state. These new voters could tip the central Illinois counties to the Democrats. This real threat further weakened the Whig Party and added to the notion that the new Republican Party was truly needed. Republican co Republicans coalesced. Statewide anti-prohibitionists in 1855 elections demonstrated to the Republican leaders that the tension between the know-nothing nativism and German voters was a problem. The Germans voted beer over salvation. Temperance Republicans and Whigs backed a hard-fought statewide prohibition referendum in June, which failed. 60% of McLean County voters backed the prohibition referendum. This referendum clearly eroded Republican fusion efforts. For in this off-year election, the liquor issue strongly attracted voters. The referendum proved that German Protestants would not join in an anti-liquor effort. The results also were viewed as a test vote for the upcoming statewide elections of 1856. And in those elections, the 1856 elections were successful ultimately for the Republicans. Germans were slated on the ticket, and in Bloomington, the Republicans reluctantly agreed to lager beer. They said, it was healthy, it was good for you. The party won both the know-nothings and the German voters, which allowed them to sweep state offices. So now you can see a little more about whiskey versus lager beer as, as a, one of the themes. 1858 election. By 1858, Republicans had yielded to the Democrats when it came to getting the Irish vote. The Republicans attacked the Irish, calling them voting cattle. No nothing sentiment was strong and empowered within the party. The attacks moved on from immigrants in general to Irish Catholics specifically. The Republicans were convinced that the Democrats intended on voter fraud by enabling Irishmen to lie about residency in order to swing the vote in key areas. The tactic was named colonizing. Irish workers were said to be paid to travel into such swing areas such as McLean County and take short-term jobs harvesting corn and the like. By this tactic, the colonizers would claim residency and vote. The Irish were also accused of forging naturalization Republicans were encouraged to organize defense associations which would guard the polls against such foreign invasion. The Irish in McLean County responded by organizing the McLean County Naturalization Society. The or organizers were saloon keepers and grocers who would provide funds for expenses related to the naturalization and legal advice. The association would pay legal costs for all immigrants who were denied their naturalization papers. These papers served as a kind of voter identification at some polling stations. These issues were further compounded by the fact that voting law was not well written, well understood, or widely uh, observed. At that point, Illinois voting law was after one year residency, you can vote in all elections. And what they meant by one year residency is was not well defined. So essentially these immigrants were essentially empowered to pretty much vote pretty quickly after they arrived, after perhaps working for a year on the railroad. As the election neared, stories originating with the Chicago Daily Press and Tribune raised fears of voting fraud. In news stories, Irish Catholics were called the enemy. The Tribune compared rumors of colonizing Irish voters with the notorious vote frauds in violence-torn Kansas. It was reported that counties along the Chicago and Mississippi Railroad and in the Illinois River Valley would suffer from the wandering Irish. The Chicago Tribune wrote, 
Our people will make stand against the further progress of the Catholic Irish element. Stories from Springfield, Peoria, St. Louis, and Paris, Illinois newspapers reported that the Irish in St. Louis had been hired to go into Illinois to vote for Douglas. An Irishman purportedly said of a job agent, Faith, he does not want us to go for work. He wants us for carpetbag men. Carpetbag man is the guy who's traveling, okay? Other stories tell the stories, or other stories tell of Irish sent along the Illinois Central Railroad to infiltrate counties and swing the vote for Democrats. The Bloomington, Illinois statesman warned of the dangers of anti-Irish defense associations. The paper stated that this was nothing but a threat of violence to Irish Catholics. But even Abraham Lincoln was swept into the paranoia. He wrote, quote, I now have a high degree of confidence that we shall succeed if we are not overrun with fraudulent voters to the greater extent than usual. On alighting from the cars and walking three squares at Naples, Illinois, on Monday, I met about 15 Celtic gentlemen with black carpet sacks in their hand. The pantograph reported voter fraud at Bloomington in the November election. An Irishman tried to vote using another man's naturalization papers. Election judges recognized the ruse and rejected him as a voter. This, the paper reported, discouraged others from trying to cheat. John L. Rout, a Republican leader who was judge of the polls, wrote the pantograph that stories of Irish using false naturalization papers in Bloomington were false. He said the voters were gentlemanly and polite to the judges, but one or two were reluctant to have their papers examined. The 1858 election was a great disappointment to Abraham Lincoln. Although he won the popular vote, the state legislature went to the Democratic Party, and that Democratic Party elected Stephen Douglas as an Illinois senator. However, Lincoln did win national recognition, a factor much to his favor two years hence. 1860 election. In 1860, widening appeal for the Democrats was found, thought to be found in cries of N-word equality, the view that the Republicans would, they didn't use N-word as a word then, okay. Uh, the view that Republicans would grant civic equality to African Americans. So the idea of civic equality was heavily, heavily opposed by the Democrats. The Democrats' view was that this would lead to intermarriage between whites and blacks. Furthermore, such equality was to drag the immigrant Irish and German workers down in their social standing. The Republicans had consolidated their fused party. They established a balance between abolitionists and old Whigs, who were wary of the former. They kept the old know-nothings happy by continuing anti-Irish Catholic rhetoric. The Republican Party maintained its strong opposition to the spread of slavery, dodged accusations of offering an open hand to African Americans, and it pointed to opening new lands for white labor through a Homestead Act. The Republican Party is trying to pull back from being viewed as a pro-African American party in this point. In September 1860, more attention was turned to voters and voter turnout. The immigrant vote was no longer in contention. The Germans would vote Republican and the Irish Democratic. The negative views of 1858 that had been directed at the Irish were resurrected. At issue again were accusations of voter fraud, specifically colonizing voters. The Democrats were ready with rebuttals. The Democrats accused the Republicans of bringing in people from Kansas to vote. One Democratic stalwart asserted that the Illinois State Normal University students should not vote locally because they are not residents or legal voters. And he expanded on colonizing accusations and stated that, quote, music teachers, school teachers, lecturers, and book agents were being sent into swing areas as colonizers. I just love the, uh, that line, the book agents, people, you know. Republicans responded that this was all a cover for the real problem, which was the Democrats voting cattle, 
that means the Irish, who were being brought down from Wisconsin and Iowa with the promise of railroad work. The Republicans claimed not to have such migrating voting herds. They pointed out that the Germans who were frugal people who would work hard and stay at home. And there's undoubtedly some truth to both sets of accusations. Illinois Republicans raised Eastern money to be used for colonizing doubtful downstate Illinois counties. You know, there's letters from Judge Davis to talk about raise, where he's raising money to bring, you know, bring people from Kansas, you know, into Illinois. Irish Catholics were specifically called out for their Democratic Party support. Republicans made an effort to include an Irishman or two in their party, but clearly the vast majority had firmly gone over to the Democratic Party. And there's a, there's a racist undertone to some of this. When Douglas spoke in Bloomington in 1858, a key part of his speech, and this was part of the senatorial campaign, was that the Constitution was written for white people. And immigrants are white, and therefore you are covered by the Constitution. African Americans are black, they're not covered by the Constitution. That was the promise that Douglas made in 58, and of course he repeated that in 60. Near election day, the pantograph let its martial spirit out. It called out names of the enemy, including Irish Catholics, in an editorial titled, Upon Them, Soldiers, One and All. The Lincoln Marching Clubs, such as the White Awakes, the Rangers, and Continentals, uh, were to attack the enemy, who were the squatter sovereigners, sovereigners, the bellmen, Irish Catholic, or Breckenridge men, and Braggadagio, this is a wonderful word, Braggadagio disunionists of the South. You know, and braggarts, I guess, who were all drawn out against you in a hostile array. That fall, the larger questions of the impact of a Lincoln victory were asked, and the, were asked, and the panograph wrote, he then, who denies the irrepressible conflict, either denies that slavery is wrong, is an evil, or he asserts, as do the southern statesmen, that free labor is a failure or is, in other words, wrong. Local Democrats themselves were not cheered by this stark choice. In an editorial in the Bloomington Statesman, it was bitterly viewed that Southern Democrats would give a Lincoln a victory by splitting the Democratic vote. As, and as secessionists, they would reap the whirlwind. The editorial stated that or the editorialist, stated he preferred an intervention against slavery over an intervention to establish slavery, as the secessionists had demanded. So that was the moderate democratic position. The 1860 election was a clean sweep for the Republicans in Illinois and a plurality for Lincoln in the United States. The Irish voted the democratic ticket. When the war broke out, the local Irish American militia, Healy's company, volunteered for service. And after initial rejection in May of 1861, many were later taken into the service during a call up at 1861, and then actually with later call ups. So the Irish were happy to serve to preserve the Union. So that's the end of that paper. <laughs> And Carl's got a mic, so yeah. if anybody Thank has you. Any um, and if I can just make mention, uh, we're live streaming the event, so that's why I have the microphone. So if uh, you have a question you'd like to ask Greg, let me know and I'll bring the mic over for you. Okay. Back here. Ah, sorry. I thought the promotional material said you were bringing samples of the spirits of which you were spoke. I'm, I, I'm treating across the street at 3 p.m. Okay, I, I was just wondering. You want to hang around? You're welcome. <laughs> um, the role of taverns uh, in politics in the community. Um, I know around 1900, I, I thought I heard the number, there was like 97 taverns in downtown Bloomington around that time. Um, and I had an uncle in Chicago who was a precinct committeeman, 
and he literally was in the taverns every night, uh, partly a rationalization, but also partly a reality of that's where politics were handled. Um, so what do you think the role of taverns were in this community as it related to the politics of which you were speaking? Well, I would say that the taverns existed uh, as an expression of culture, and immigrant communities in particular found those places to coalesce outside of their religious communities. So you had a secular, the place on a secular basis to coalesce would be uh, in a tavern. Uh, tavern drinking um, was considered unsuitable for upright middle class Protestants um, who in their defense when prohibition was suggested in Bloomington in 1870, uh, they recommended a law that was called the One Gallon Act where you could only buy a gallon at a time and it really only be uh, wealthier people who could afford to buy a gallon of booze and take it home and drink it, okay? And so there is a considerable amount of private tippling done by many Protestants and a considerable amount of public tipping, tippling done by many immigrants who were mostly Catholic. So um, the number of taverns that you're quoting, 97, not around downtown, but probably in Bloomington, uh, as a whole, there, probably, there could have been up to 97. Um, some, the uh, blind pigs and shabines, uh, those illegal places, probably would get that number up there. In terms of legal establishments, it might be closer to 70. And it would be easy enough to check out, simply count how many taverns show up in the city directories. Does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? Uh, we have recently become aware of a uh, parade through the country of the Ulster Historical Foundation, and it's in Michigan City that we're going up to next week. I wonder if there's any indication that the Scots-Irish, uh, the non-Catholic Irish, were wandering around McLean County at that time, uh, which would have put them in the... Uh, the non-Catholic group? They were non-Catholic. Uh, there were, McLean County was essentially settled by Scots-Irish or Ulster-Irish. Okay. And if, and if they weren't first generation, then second and third generation, certainly. So the settlement culture of McLean County was very much a Ulster-Irish type of culture. That was really the dominant culture. The, um, and they're also a whiskey culture. And so, um, was there whiskey? Yeah, there were distilleries opened here in the 1840s. Um, the, these folks, um, so how did they vote? Uh, the Democratic Party was heavily Ulster Irish or Scots Irish in the 19th century. Um, I like to point out that the attorney, um, who uh, helped start State Farm Insurance Company. His name was Adley Rust. Okay. Now, why did Adley's parents name him Adley? Well, it was obviously a tribute to the Vice President of the United States, you know? And so even the Rust family, uh, state, now State Farm were name, right? The Rust family were uh, Democrats. And so they were, uh, they, they were, did, did they, uh, I don't want to say, they were landowners, and so they were rec certainly recognized as part of the community. Um, and I don't know whether they had a horse in this particular race in terms of what was happening to the saloons. I, I just can't answer that. I've not run across that. Okay. But, but certainly they were, you know, pro-whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Other questions for Greg? Okay, well, Greg, thank you so much. Okay, thank you for having me. It's always interesting to hear you talk because you take McLean County history, which sometimes may appear to be rather bland and mundane and really kind of add uh, a nice nuance to all of it and such and make it come alive. So well, thank, thank you, you so much. Carl. 
Um, I'd also like to invite you to uh, be back here again in April for our Lunch and Learn. Uh, Bob Bradley and Rini Bradley are going to be here to talk about quirky sites in Illinois, some of the unusual places uh, that uh, you can go visit to see the world's largest functioning rocking chair, a fire-breathing dragon, a 50-foot uh, cement mermaid, and all of the other oddities that uh, make up uh, an interesting Illinois. Uh, I'd also like to mention that uh, Greg will actually be talking at the ACLU uh, on April 11th at 7 o'clock um, with a program entitled Contested Civil Liberties in the 19th Century in McLean County. So uh, if you'd like to hear Greg again and other interesting stories, please come and see Greg at the ACLU event um, actually here in this room. Okay? Great. All right, if not, uh, any other questions for Greg? Uh, we'll stand adjourned until next uh, month. Thank you so much.